right, well, we want to welcome everyone and those watching online today to week two of our brand new series called God Never Said That. I don't know, the video kind of seemed like one of those old kung fu movies. There was a little delayed in the voice. But in this series, we have been talking about some of the cultural beliefs, or I would say misbeliefs, uh, that have been attributed to God. Uh, but the problem is, I can't find it in my Bible. And as, as we saw the video today, one of those things or myths actually is that uh, God will never put on you more than you can handle. Last week we kicked off the series talking about this idea of above else God wants you to be happy. And so how many of y'all enjoyed that last week as we talked about, uh, you know, really the truth is God does delight in our happiness. And I kind of gave the, uh, the illustration of Skylar and uh, how I delight in Skylar as my son. Uh, but, but more importantly, I think God wants us to move past happiness because happiness is based on happenings. Amen? But God wants us to begin to operate in joy. And joy doesn't fluctuate with our circumstances. So if you missed that, um, that is online now. Or you can uh, get a copy of that uh, DVD or CD at our uh, kiosk. And so next week, it's going to be real important that you get your friends here, your family here. Go on and turn to your neighbor with, with some attitude and say, get your people here. All right? Get your people here here because next week we're going to just just totally debunk the myth that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Uh, uh, that's really uh, what I'm going after next week and so you don't want to miss that and that's going to be our Easter Sunday. But today I want to continue uh, the series with one of my favorite and we just went, watched the, the video that God will not put on you more than you can handle. And let's just do this as fun by a show of hands. How many of y'all have heard that very statement? Come on, just be honest today that, that you've heard that. And so, and so, yeah, I think that we've all heard that. And, and, and so I want to go ahead and give you the reason why. This idea comes from a familiar passage found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you want to turn there. And it's oftentimes misunderstood or misquoted. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse 13, the scripture says that if you, if you don't have your Bible, you can look up at the Sky Bible there. And uh, actually, you have message notes. You can flip them over to and follow along. But here's what the Apostle Paul writes to the church of Corinth. He says, no temptation has overtaken you. That is not common to man. So here's what Paul is saying. He's saying nothing that you're facing in this life, nothing that you're going, to, uh, going through is any different than what your brothers and sisters or anyone else has experienced. He says no temptation uh, is common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your abilities. And says, but with this temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And the whole church said, amen. So it's very clear from this passage what he is not saying is that he won't give you more than you can handle. He's saying that he will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. Let me give you a couple facts about temptation if you're taking notes today. You can jot this down. Uh, number one is God is not the one tempting you. All right? So let's just set the, the record straight today. God is not the one tempting you. He never tempts you. And it's important that you understand this as a believer. Because if you attribute the temptations in this life to God, then you won't resist them. And so if you think that God is the one tempting you in areas of your life, uh, then you will embrace them because who wants to fight against God, right? Everybody got that? And so if we don't have a proper understanding where temptation comes from, then when they come, and they will, uh, if you're not in a season of temptation or battling some temptations, and maybe you just came out of a season, uh, there will be a time that you will have temptations in your life. And so here's what James says about temptation. James chapter 1 and in verse 13. He says, remember when you are being tempted. He says, remember, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted. Come on, read it with me together. To do what? To do wrong. Let's read it together. God is never tempted to do wrong. <laughs> so it's important that we understand that. God is not the one tempting you today. He's not the one that is putting temptation in your path or in your in your way he says 
Uh, but God never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from what? What's it come from? Our own what? Desires, which entice us and drag us away. And these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So here's a process. Temptation, if not dealt with, turns in to sin. And guess what happens when we give birth to sin and sin uh, begins to rule and reign in our life? It produces death, right? Uh, my friend, just um, thinking about that, um, to some of his habits and things that were destructive in his life produce death. He, he OD'd because of some of the things that he struggled with. And so if we don't get the temptation at the root uh, of when it comes to us and we don't deal with that, uh, I like to say it this way, uh, if we don't deal with our thought life, uh, thoughts lives turn into emotions and emotions will eventually turn into actions and actions will turn into a lifestyle. And once we get to a level of a lifestyle, someone coming out of uh, almost two decades of addiction, uh, what happens is it produces death in our lives and it will uh, still kill and destroy. And so James is saying that, that it's our evil desire. It's the flesh that gives uh, a birth to these things. He says, don't be misled, dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good, say that together. Say, whatever is good. Come on, you can do better than that. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down from God, our Father, who created all the lights in the heaven. And guess what? He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. I want to tell you this morning, temptation is not a gift from God. Amen? He just said that every gift is good, right? And so we all agree today that temptation is not good. Unless you're tempted to bless somebody's socks off and do something in, in, that would bless somebody, then temptation is always, always, always from two primary, uh, primarily sources. One, it's from the enemy. He is always trying to accuse us. He is always casting seed and, into our mind and trying to get us out of the will of God. There's a real war going on in our life, and we do have a real enemy. He's not just a cartoon character with a pitchfork and, you know, uh, and a red costume. Uh, Satan is alive and well, and he is referred to as the God of this age, uh, the God uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of this world. And we do need to understand that we're in a spiritual battle. And if some of you are struggling, Struggling right now, uh, maybe you don't realize that you're in a spiritual battle. Maybe you need to, to gain some understanding today that you are in a battle. And, and to win a battle, you need to have a, a plan. Amen? You need, to, you need to be strategic about that plan. And so, and so the first thing you need to understand is God is not the one tempting you. Number two, you can write this down. God will test your faith. God will test your faith. Trials, I, I personally don't believe come from God, but enduring them will strengthen your faith. I believe that, that God doesn't put sickness on you. God doesn't teach you uh, through tragedy. But I believe that we live in a fallen world. And I believe that God doesn't violate our free will. Uh, I, just, to, just to remind you, I hear people say this all the time. They say, well, where was God when this person was killed? And I just want to say to them at times, well, where was he when the first murder happened in the Bible? He was right there because he confronted his brother and said, Cain, where is your brother? Uh, so we see that God didn't get involved in the first murder in the scriptures. And so the truth of the matter is God has given every one of us a free will. And God wants us to choose him. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 19. He says, I call heaven and earth before you this day. And I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And then he gives us this amazing, amazing choice. And he says, therefore, choose life. That it may go well with you. And that your seed may live. And so there's a choice that, that we have. And standing on the word of God and not giving up in the middle of your trial will always, always encourage and build your faith. Amen? 
And so when we, when we get a promise from God and, and when we know what God's word says concerning a situation in our life, when we stand on that, I do want to tell you, you will come out stronger. Amen? If, if you're battling something today and you'll get firm in the word of God and you'll say, I don't care what the circumstance looks like, I've got a promise from God, I've got a word from God, and you'll stand steadfast and you'll see the salvation of the Lord and the deliverance of the Lord, I do want to tell you, You'll come out stronger, amen? You'll come out on the other side of that thing better than you started. But we need to understand that God is a good God. God's not the one putting tragedies in your life, amen? Standing on the word of God will test your faith. And I'll tell you this, obedience will test your faith. And that's what I love about the story with Abraham. Abraham is our father of faith, and rightly so. It says he believed God And it was accounted to him as righteousness. And so with the story of Abraham, we see that Abraham was given a promise. And that promise was Isaac. It was the the promised seed. And and so I could say a whole lot about the context. But I just want to say that Abraham was patiently waiting on this promise. And at some point with this promised child being born, the Lord asked him to do a very difficult thing. And so we pick it up in Genesis chapter 22. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham. He tested him. And he said to him, Abraham... And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Morah and offer him there as a burnt offering to the, one of the mountains, which I, have, I shall tell you. And so Abraham rose early in the morning. He saddled his donkey and he took with him his young men. And he took Isaac and he cut the wood for the burnt offering. And he arose and went to the place that God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw The place afar off. And then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. And I and the boy will go over there and worship. And I will come back to you again. And I love what Abraham says. Notice what he says. I want to direct your attention back to the last verse. He said, And I and the boy will go over here and worship. And come back to you again. You know the Lord spoke to me one day and said Sean. He knew he was coming back again. Amen. The test was whether he would go. Because God had given him the promise. He had given him the son. And many times in our life God has spoken a word. He has told us to do something. But somewhere along the way we've let fear creep in. We've let doubt creep in. We've let people around us creep in. And begin to steal the seed and the promise. Well you know the story. Abraham and his son goes up to the mountain. And there he ties his son down. I can just imagine the pain and anguish that it must have been. Even knowing that Abraham and his heart told his servants he would be back with his son but going through that whole thing must have been horrific but you know the story when he lifts up the knife the Lord says no you're not to harm him and and he passed the tests why because God will test us in this life make no mistake about it you can't grow from glory to glory without enduring and going through things church You can't strengthen yourself and your character without being tested at times. And I find a lot of times that people are okay as long as it's tipping through the tulips. But when things begin to get tough and life begins to throw circumstances at us, we find a lot of times that as the tough gets going, the the going gets tough and the people get going and people begin to fall away from the faith. And I tell you that I'm reminded in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. I love the aging apostle tells us that there's a grieving when we go through trials. I don't know about you, but I've been grieved in some of my trials. Has anybody ever been grieved through a trial where they're, they're just, they're burdened. They have a heaviness on them. He says, but that the genuineness of your faith being much more Precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I just want to say this today. If you're a believer and you're following Jesus, you're going to face trials when you let your light shine. I may repeat that. If you're really following Jesus and you're really making a difference for him, you're going to face trials in this life. You're going to face 
persecution in this life. You're going to have sufferings that are going to compare to the sufferings of Christ. Beware, Jesus said, when all men speak well of you. You know, I have people, they say, well, pastor, they're saying this and they're saying that about me. I said, beware when all men speak well of you. If you're not making a, 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 some type of fuss sometimes with the way you live and the things you do, you might need to watch out and look which way you're walking and which, who you're walking with. Because when you're making a difference in the kingdom, sometimes people aren't going to understand it. Things are going to be misunderstood. People will, will, will judge things by appearance and not know the motive. Right? Jesus said, beware of judging things by appearance only. Amen? Why? Because he's the only one that knows the heart. And sometimes we, we can look at a situation from the outside, like, oh, I don't know what's going on there. I don't, you know? And we don't really know what, what really is happening there. We don't know the heart. Only God. Second Samuel 16 says that God looks upon the heart. We don't have the ability to, to look in the heart. But I love this passage. He says that, that it's like more precious than gold. And he talks about it being tested by fire. And you know, if anybody knows anything about gold, when they, when they, when they heat up the gold uh, to get to the pure gold, all the impurities begin to melt off. All, all the stuff that goes through the fire begins to fall off. And then all the impurities sink and all the good stuff rises to the top. And I like to think of our lives like that. I like to think about, you know, when we're going through something and we're, we're tested and we're, we're trusting God that all of this stuff that, that, we, that God is trying to get rid of in our lives begins to fall off. And we begin to be strengthened and renewed. You know, it says the outward man is forever perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. Amen? And I don't know about you, but I want my soul to continue to be renewed. I want to have more patience this time next year than I did this year. Come on, amen? Anybody got kids and want more patience this time? You don't want to snap on your... On on your, on your child uh, like you're doing. Yeah, I see her, her wives tapping on husbands right now. Yeah, you need to listen to that right there. Listen to the preacher. But, you know, we, we go through seasons of our lives where God is refining us. And, and, and he's, he's allowing things to fall off in our lives so that. Here, let me just say this. The anointing of God lives in us. You have the anointing. You don't have to ask for it. If you have Christ, the anointed one, he lives in you. Amen? But he can only flee. Flow through your character, praise God. So if your character is jacked up and you got all kind of issues, the anointing can only do so much because it flows through you. That, that deserved a better amen. It can only go through what it's flowing through. So if you got areas of your life that, that is hard and, and, it's, and it's, it's difficult for God to get his presence in and through, and I tell you, man, if there's ever a time that we need to be vessels, it's right now. If there's ever a time that we need to have answers to people who are broken and hurting and that one answer is, you know, Peter said we need to have the hope. We need to be able to give, a, give the answers to the hope that is in us. And so the third one is every test is an open book test. You can write that down. Every test. Let me tell you this. The answers to everything you're facing is found in Scripture. Amen? You just need to get a word from God. But you don't need logos, you don't need the written word, you need rhema. You need the revealed word, amen? Lots of study isn't going to reveal it to you. You need to fellowship with God until you get a word. You need to spend time. You know, I, I, I love that I, I came on the outside of this and I can teach it. For so long I was so hungry and thirsty for knowledge. I thought knowledge was what I needed. And so I became very puffed up because I knew things. I went to Bible school and I learned things. And, and so when I would hear other believers saying things that weren't correct you know, theologically, I just wanted to correct it. I felt like God sent me to set everybody straight. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But what I found out a lot of times is I could accurately teach and understand and theologically expound on all that, but yet I wasn't experiencing that. And I found out that lots of study, logos, isn't going to get you. Where you need to go. You need to have some rhema. Come on, amen. Rhema can happen in one passage with one word where God speaks it to you. It's revealed in your heart. And guess what? It'll change your life forever. Come on, give Jesus a hand if you believe that this morning. We need a rhema word. Rhema. It's an open book test. I love what Timothy uh, says when Paul writes this letter to the young pastor in 2 Timothy 
chapter 3 and verse 16 says, All scripture is breathed out of God and profitable for teaching and for reproof and, and for correction. And I love this, for, for training and, come on, righteousness. Everything that we need is in scripture. And throughout scripture, we will find story after story after story of those who had more than they could handle. I just want to be honest today. Because when I hear this idea of God won't give you more than, than you can handle, then I just want to take my Bible and throw it. Because that's not what I find in Scripture. In fact, I just wanted to jot down a couple. Gideon in his inadequacy says, When the Lord called him to be a judge, uh, and, and the sixth judge of Israel, and defeat the enemies in the Midianites. And here you know the story. Uh, the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon. And let's read it together. And in, in, in Judges chapter 6 and verse 14, uh, uh, here's what the Scripture says. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from... The, from the hand of the Midianites. And do not do I not send you? And he said to him. Please Lord. How can I save Israel? Behold my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least of my father's house. Here, here, here uh, Gideon dealt with, with this inferior complex. That he couldn't handle the task that the Lord was giving him. Moses in the mass exodus. We know the story when, when God tells Moses to go and, and to give the word to Pharaoh. Here's what Moses says. And I'm paraphrasing. I'm slow in speech. I'm, I'm not a great speaker. I, I, I didn't go to public speaking when I was in school. I, I'm not going to be able to deliver the word that you want me. You're going to have to get somebody else. Later on we find in scripture when he's overwhelmed with everything and people are wearing him out. He tells the Lord, these are your people. Come on, anybody remember that? Your people down there. Overwhelmed with, with all of the things that God uh, had for him to do. That he, he just came to a place where he was totally just bombarded and overwhelmed. We see Esther when she was given the task of saving her people from being totally annihilated. And she had to go into the presence of the king. And, and she didn't have an appointment. And, and so she knew that this task could have taken her life. And the scripture says that she was afraid at what the Lord had put on her heart. King David with the weight of the sin and, and all that caught up with him through, through the thing with Bathsheba and stuff. And this is what he says and I quote in Psalms 38 and in verse 4 he says, My guilt has overwhelmed me and like a burden too heavy to bear I am exhausted and completely crushed. My, my groans come from an anguished heart. Think about the Apostle Paul and many times dealing with things more than he could handle. More than he could bear. I'm just reminded of 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and in verse 8. He says, we think you ought to know. Here's Paul uh, writing to the church of Corinth. Uh, Dear brothers and sisters about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. And we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought that we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. Here's the great man of faith, the apostle Paul. In a moment. Of just being transparent and saying there was a time that I didn't even think I was going to make it. It was so much that I didn't even think I could bear it. In fact, even Jesus himself was overwhelmed in his humanity. We can find this in Mark chapter 14. Jesus speaking began to deeply distressed and trouble. Mark 14 and verse 33 says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow even to the point of death. You say, Pastor, but he was God. Well, he was fully God and he was fully man. And we can clearly see it the night. Uh, uh, and he was in the Garden of Gethsemane that he asked this. He said, Father, if it, uh, uh, Father, if this could happen, let this cup pass from me. You remember the story? As he's under anguish and he's, he's sweating drops of blood, thinking about the task that was at hand. But he stepped out of his humanity Stepped into the God man who he was. And he said nevertheless it's not. It's not. Come on say it together. It's not my will. Come on it's not my will. You need to point to yourself to say it's not my will. But it's, it's thy will be done. And we know just a few hours later. Jesus was escorted to the cross. Where he was tortured and, and murdered. For your sins and for mine. And so the truth is. Uh, that there are times that we will have more that we can handle in this life. But here's the good news. I want to set you free because I didn't set all that up for failure. You don't have to handle it alone. 
You were never meant to handle it alone. This life isn't for you to live alone. And many of you are tired and burnt out and frustrated because you've been trying to do this alone. And the reason I know that is because it's a daily fight for me. I have to make sure that I am drawing on the power within. That I am allowing God, the Holy Spirit, to direct me, to empower me, to give me the ability that I need, the grace in my life, so that I can fulfill the call. Because as soon as I step out of that and step into Sean, it's always more than I can handle. And I can tell you when I know that, when my emotions are out of whack. When I start feeling frustrated, when I start feeling overwhelmed, when I start feeling like, how are we going to do this? I immediately, immediately know that I'm not in the power and the ability of the Holy Spirit. But now I've stepped back over into Sean. And when I'm in Sean, it's not good. But when I'm in the power of the Holy Spirit, it's going to work. And it's going to be okay. Amen. So I want to give you three quick things in 13 minutes and 42 seconds. You you ready? You good? I want to give you some takeaways today. So number one, this is how... Uh, you know that you will face things, and these are the reasons why. And I want to give you the first one is it because it makes us depend on God. Write that down. It makes us depend on God. Let's just be honest today, all right? Can we be honest in church? Can we? Everybody shake their head. I mean, if we can't be honest here, we can't be honest anywhere, right? It's real easy when things are going well in our lives to forget about God. Can we be honest? If not, we need to have an altar call for liars. Because every one of us, at times, when things are going well, we have a tendency in our humanity to put Jesus on the back burner. Come on, let's just be honest. When things are going well and everybody's jiving and money's good and life is good, I mean earthly, temporal life, we have a tendency to not see the need or the urgency for Jesus. And that's why for me it's so hard to really convince wealthy people or even intellectual people that have lots of degrees about the need for Jesus. Because they're so comfort in their, in their intellect or they're so comfort, comfortable in, in their wealth that they don't see the need. Some of the hardest people that I've ever witnessed to are intellectual people that have degrees. And you want to have the real, really good combination, those who are smart and wealthy. Because immediately, they don't see the need because everything's going well for them. And, and money can become a covering. It can become a covering. It becomes a covering for them in this life. And so, um, it, it doesn't allow them to maybe a lot of times face uh, circumstances like other people would. Or, or face things that the normal blue collar or the lower class person would. Uh, intellectually, they know things. And so it's hard because they like to reason. Uh, they, they don't understand faith. Faith to them is like just being irresponsible. You tell somebody that's intellectual. I remember one time I was, I was talking to somebody about giving. And I said, it's, you just got to do it by faith. You got to trust God. And you, Oh, I can't trust that, Pastor. <laughs> that's what the person said to me. And, and, and they were like, I can't trust that. I got to have, I got to have, I got to know how my money is. I got to, this is how much I got going to this and this is how much I got. I said, you, you give first and you trust God. Come on, Matthew six thirty three. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. Amen. And I'm not advocating being irresponsible with finances. I'm just simply saying we put him first, the first principle, the first fruit And guess what? Everything else begins to work. It sets up a supernatural flow in our life for things to work. But intellectual people will reason and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Give God my money first and then he's going to work everything out, right? It's counterintuitive from the culture and what we've been ingrained to believe. And and so so we have to understand that, that, that it's... It's, it's us going and depending on God. It's, it's the reason why in this life that I think that, that we go through things because it creates a dependency. You know, it's funny to me that, that you know, when things aren't going uh, so well, how soon we remember our source. 
When we get into that place, and, you know, it's kind of like uh, I heard this pastor talk about this, this situation on an airplane. And, and I, I can relate because I've flown uh, out of the country and stuff on those 25-year-old DC-9s that I don't like getting on and wondering why they haven't built a new plane. But that's another message. But um, you're flying over water at night. Did I ever tell you I don't like that neither? And, 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 and so, you know, sometimes you hit these pockets of turbulence, you know. And, and you know, you, you're on the plane and you're doing this. And I don't even like roller coasters, period. And so. So like my stomach's dropping and I'm going up and down and you know and I heard this story about this pastor that that sat next to this lady and and she asked him a question she said so what do you do for a living and he said I hate telling people I'm a pastor because either people get really offended offended and offensive or they just really get really religious and spooky spooky he said it's either one or the other so I try not to I just try to be myself on the plane but she kept on and on about who he was and and he said well I'm a pastor and she said well I just want you to know I'm an atheist and don't try to convert me he's like oh okay cool I'm not gonna you know and so they were talking he said after they kind of settled that they had a great time on the plane but yet they hit some turbulence and it was turbulence from hell has anybody ever been on them kind of plane rides where you just think the thing is going down right and if you're baptizing the Holy Spirit you're praying in tongues on the plane and you don't care who hears it and this is the kind of turbulence that was going on and in this turbulence she says Oh my God, we're going to have to pray. It's ironic to me that atheists in the middle of a storm want you to pray with them. It's amazing. The God they don't believe in that they just asked, could we pray? Why? Because when things aren't going so well, we, we seem to tend to remember our source. And God wants us to depend on him. And again, you know, I think that it's, I wrote this on Facebook the other day, or last night, I think. Uh, a lot of times we, we, we grow in relationship in the valley than we do on the mountaintop. Come on, let's just be honest. When everything's going well and numbers are good and things are happening, you know, we, we seem to be a little more self-dependent. But when we're going through that trial, we just was told that our loved one has only a few weeks to live. Or we got a bad report on the doctor from our, you know, about one of our kids. Or, you know, we find out that we're being laid off. Oh, 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 oh. How things begin to change. How our perception begins to change. And we, we begin to grow dependent on him. I love the story of Jonah. And, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to get into the whole context. But you know the story. If you even went to uh, Sunday school, you heard the story about Jonah and the fish. And how he was to go and pre the preach to the, Nin the Ninevites about, you know, repenting. And, and so, of course, he didn't want to do that because he had some personal vendetta. Didn't like the Ninevites. And so he decides he's going to buck and get on a boat and sail out. And God ends up getting a hold of him. And, and the story is he repents and comes back and does what God asked him. But I love this. In Jonah chapter 2, he says, in my distress, I called out to the Lord and he answered me. Notice he didn't say, in my success. In my success. He said, in his distress, I called out and the Lord answered me. When my life was ebbing away, I mentioned you and my prayer rose to you. It's, a, it's amazing how we crave God in our distress. and Not so much in our success. And I just believe that God wants us to get to a, a lifestyle that we're totally dependent on him. And, and I'll just be like the Apostle Paul, and I'll just be real transparent and say, I haven't attained that. So your past, don't look at me today as I'm more holy than you. I haven't attained that. But here's where I'm at. Uh, praise God that I've left. Amen. I'm not where I used to be. Praise God. And I am pressing forward to that mark and to that call. And, and in fact, I just believe uh, God spoke to me just this week a, a specific word for my life about living a set apart life. About making sure, Sean, that your life is set apart. And I'm not talking about weird religious legalism. But I am talking about a life that is so set apart that we're so focused and that we're not distracted with the cares and the things of this world that we can make a greater impact. Because I want to tell you, I believe God sent me to be a voice to a generation. And as I'm saying that about myself, I want to say that God has sent you to be a voice to this generation. Come on, amen. He's needing people that will rise up in the workplace, in the schools, and in the market 
marketplace and begin to declare who Jesus is on the earth. I don't know if anybody's excited about that, but I'm excited about the, 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 the incredible responsibility that we have to share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we need to, need to make sure that we, we live a life that we're dependent on him. Number two, it builds character when we overcome. It builds character when we overcome. As I mentioned, when we stand on the promises of God, we, 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 we come out stronger and more mature. And, and, and though God's not the author of our trials, but he will use them. I want to tell you, Romans 8, 28 is in effect. It is. If you love God and, and you're called according to his purpose, guess what? You will come out on the other side and, and you will I just, I'm just reminded of Paul, you know, in his, his, his letter to the church of Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And, and Paul is receiving all these great revelations. And, and God is using Paul mightily. And here's what we see in scripture. It says, a thorn was given to me in the flesh. A, a messenger of Satan. Here's, here's where you know where it came from. So if you're, if, you're, if you're concerned about where the thorn came from, it says, it was a messenger of Satan who, who gave it to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, come on, read it together. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. I love that. In your weakness, he is made strong. In your weakness, God is able to do. Because as long as you continue to hold the reins and say, I got this, God. You can take a back seat. Your life will continue to follow suit. But when you, can, when you get to a place that you'll give it up. And I love what Jesus said. When you lose your life, guess what? You find it. And when you find it, there you'll lose it. He says that my grace is sufficient for you. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness. Paul said, I'm boasting in my weakness. I love that. He said, I'm boasting in my ability. He says, in my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, he says, I am content with this weakness. Insults, hardships, and persecutions, and calamities. Let's read it together. He says, for when I am weak, come on, say it again. When I am weak, Come on, say it again. I want you to get this in your spirit today. For when I am weak, one more time. For when I am weak, somebody needs to hear that today. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul had mastered the ability of learning to step out of Paul and step into Christ. Paul had mastered. That's why he could write Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 28. Therefore, put on the new man that was recreated in righteousness and true holiness. Paul understood that we had to put him on daily. Paul understood that we had him. It wasn't nothing that we had to pray and ask God for. It was in us, but we had to put it on. Again, going back to the choice of us putting it on. And some of you right now, I see you rowing. I see you rowing. You're striving. You're rowing. You're rowing and you're rowing and you're rowing and you're tired. Does anybody ever row a boat or been on a kayak or paddle a surfboard? It's tiring. You're rowing and you're rowing, especially if you're going against the current. One of the things I hate about surfing when there's a northeast wind is there's a drift. And I'm always paddling to stay on that sandbar where the waves are breaking. I'm constantly paddling. And it's like a conveyor belt. The ocean is moving this way and I'm on a surfboard paddling this way way constantly and some of you today in your relationship with God is you're striving and you're rowing and you're rowing and I want to tell you something the spirit of God woke me up this morning to tell you that you need to raise the sail up praise God and you need to stop rowing and start sailing hallelujah you need to start sailing and quit striving Zechariah told us this in Zechariah 4 and verse 6 he said it's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit. Some of you need to let the, the sail of the Spirit up in your life. And you need to start sailing. You need to quit rowing. You need to learn to ride in the boat. Amen? You need to learn to ride in it instead of trying to, trying to be the force that moves the boat. I love what First John 5 says. He says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the the world. I love the King James says, even our faith. And number three, you can write this down as we close. It gives us a testimony to those around us. 
when you go through something, people are watching your life. And here's the test where we often fail. Oftentimes, they don't see anything different in our lives than what they see in the world. It usually gets quiet. Hey, I'm pointing fingers right at me. There's times <clears throat> that I wish. Does anybody wish we could rewind and do some things different? Come on, anybody just going to be honest? Come on, let's just have church. Let's be honest. Anybody wish last week they shouldn't have said what they said in the heat of the moment or what they, come on, let's just have church. Yeah. So I think we all have said some things or, or we've done some things. Uh, it wasn't the right motive and we just wish we could rewind. We just wish <clears throat> that in that moment that we could, we could just stop and, and do it again and, and say, you know what, I'm not going to do that this time because here's the reality. Our lifestyle is preaching louder than what we're saying. And I love what I think Spurgeon said. He, he, he said this. He said, uh, preach the gospel everywhere you go and use words if you have to. And so people are, are not so much concerned about what you're saying as, as much as they are about what you're doing. And if you really want to see people come to know Jesus and the culture and the day in which we live, I want to tell you something, Grace City. Here's, here's, here's the pep rally, uh, you know, the climactic explosion of what I want to say today. It's going to take them seeing something different in your life. It's going to take them seeing you in the middle of your trial, in the middle of your uh, uh, circumstance, responding differently. There's nothing attractive to want to follow somebody, and we have the answers, but yet we're no different than them. And so I just believe that it's the testimony. It's the testimony. In fact, I love what Revelation says. Revelation says it this way in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 he says and they have defeated him Satan by the blood of the lamb come on and by the word of their testimony testimony you know my pastor used to say this down south and I loved it he said Sean they may argue with your doctrine they may argue with your Bible but they can't argue with your testimony you are never at the mercy of somebody else about your testimony. You know what? It belongs to you, praise God. Yeah, you ought to clap. It belongs to you. It's your testimony. And you know what I find? The best way to evangelize? Tell your testimony. Tell your story. You know, when I was at that funeral, I saw people that I hadn't seen in 20 years. Some I was sitting next to were nodding off on heroin opiates, some were jacked up on cocaine some were clean one of the things that I was so grateful to God was every one of them knew me back then they knew all the bad all the ugly all the violence all the stuff and they got to see my changed life I didn't run around the funeral home telling people about what God did in my life. I didn't run around preaching how good Jesus is. They know by my life. They know I'm not who I used to be. I don't go places I used to go and I don't do things I used to do. And this just week, I can't tell you how many Facebook inboxes from those people just at that funeral started reaching out to me. And I was able to minister to them. It was a door, a factual door was open by the way I live. Now I'm not boasting on me, I'm boasting on Jesus because in me there's no good thing that dwells but Him. But I'm saying that if we'll begin to live a life that people can see the Jesus in us and that's why I started this church for discipleship because we can have great services guys, we can have great worship and we can have good preaching and y'all can shout me down and I can shout you down and we can do all that and high five five people and all that and that's great and it's a pet rally. But what are we going to do in a few hours when we go out to eat? What are we going to do? Because the church isn't this movie theater. The church is you. And when you leave here, you're going to make an impact on somebody, whether it's good or bad. In a few minutes, you're going to be somewhere eating. And you're going to make an impact on those that are serving you, good or bad, depending on how you treat them. 
You're going to make an impact on, on, on those this week on your job. And, and so if you're telling them how great your church is and how awesome Grace City is, but then in that circumstance, in that situation that's hard for you to handle, are you going to step out of you and step over into Christ? Or are you going to let you be the one that shows out and then that person that's looking at your life and looking at what you're saying about Jesus going, why would I want to go to that? If that's what it produces. And so as we think about this, this idea of a testimony, what does your testimony mean to you? You know, sometimes it's just, hey, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to ruin my testimony about Jesus. Man, there's nothing that I can tell you more important than keeping your testimony, man. Once you lose your testimony, you know, when I think about people that have fallen from ministry, I'm not saying God doesn't restore them. I'm not saying God doesn't love them. I'm not saying that God, you know, still doesn't use them. But I'm saying when you see people, and I could name a few names right now and everybody would know, you'll never see the influence that they once had. You'll never see those that had churches of tens of thousands now that are pastoring a church of 500. You know why? Because of their testimony. Their testimony. It was hurt. It was hurt in their lifestyle. It was hurt in the choices they made. And their influence. Now their capacity to reach people is not what it once was. I don't know about you, Grace City. But for me, I want my testimony to be one that displays the nature and the character of Christ. Now again, I don't do that perfectly. But shouldn't we strive after that? Come on, amen. Shouldn't that be the goal that we go from glory to glory to glory? That we, we look like him, we talk like him, we, we respond in situations like, he's, like he would? I think, I think that's really what we're all after, amen? Yeah. So today as we, we close the service, with every head bowed and every eye closed, Maybe you're here today and, you know, you've just been in a trial. You've been in a season of, of things that just, uh, it just seems to be so hard that you, you've asked yourself how much more you can go through it. And you've even maybe cried out to God and asked God, you know, why? And you're at this place today that you just feel overwhelmed, you feel burden, you feel heavy and I want to tell you today that God is waiting on you to step over into him and to step out of self he's waiting for you to yield this situation over to him so that he can take the wheel so if that's you right now, you just say pastor I just want to be honest, there's some things in my life that I just need to give to Jesus. I just want you to slip your hand up right where you are. That's you. Hands all over. There's just some things in my life. I see your hands. You can put them down. I see your hands. I see your hands. And just say, I'm just worrying. I'm anxious, man. I, I don't know how this is going to out. The outcome of this, this relationship, this financial situation, I'm just... I'm tired, I'm, I'm weary, I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm at a place that I just don't know if I can continue on. I want to tell you today, there's good news. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by the Spirit. And God, by His Holy Spirit, wants to enable you today to come through. Listen, we were never meant to stay in the valley. If you go back and read the psalmist, it says, though I walk through, come on, amen, though I walk through, the valley. Though I walk through the valley. Some of you have been staying in the valley. Some of you have been parked in the valley. Some of you are building your house in the valley. And God never intended on you to stay in the valley. He wants you to go through the valley because on the other side of the valley there's a blessing. On the other side of the valley He can do a work in your life. On the other side of the valley there is a mountaintop waiting for you. So Father in this place I thank you for every soul here. Thank you for every person here, God, that is in a tough spot. They're in a valley. They're in a dark place today. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the light. God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal, you would reveal, Lord, the areas that we need to take our hands off, God, that we need to relinquish, that we need to step away from, Lord, and we need to fully, totally give ourselves away give ourselves to you today 
Father, I pray today, Lord, that we would that we would all search our hearts in this holy moment, God, and that we would we would just confess those areas, whatever they are, whatever it is right now. I just want you right there with nobody looking around. I just want you to confess whatever that is. I just want you to say, God, I'm giving it to you right now. Maybe it's a relationship. God, I'm giving you that person. Maybe it's a financial situation. God, I'm giving you that situation. I'm not going to worry on it. I'm not going to put my hands on it. I'm trusting you right now. Maybe it's something in your body right now that you're just struggling with. It's a pain. It's a, it's a sickness. God, I trust you. Your word is true. I don't care what my circumstances are saying and what they're preaching right now. I'm trusting you right now. I give you whatever that is right now. I give it to you. I give it to you. As an act of faith, say it out your mouth right now. God, I'm giving that to you right now in Jesus name thank you Jesus hallelujah hallelujah I just believe right now under the sound of my voice those things are changing right now I believe there's kairos moments right now that are shiftings right now that are beginning to happen in your life I believe that you've allowed the Holy Spirit now to move in that area and he is starting to move in that area right now I believe he's dealing with things as we speak right now he's setting things up right now he's about to take your mess and make it a message he's about to take your test and make it a testimony he's about to take your setback and he's about to turn it into a setup all for his glory in Jesus name if you're here today you just say pastor I don't know this Jesus that you're you're talking about I don't know who he is and I want to know him today I want you just with every head bowed and every eye closed if that's you just be honest say God I I need you today pastor I need Jesus today just slip your hand up I need Jesus I want to pray with you I need Jesus Amen, amen. I see your hand. You can put it down. Come on, church. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending Jesus. And right now, I believe that Jesus was the Son of God. He was born of a virgin. He died on a cross for my sins. And I receive the payment right now. And from this point on, I am made righteous. I am a new creation. I have what he says I have. And I can do what he says I can do. Holy Spirit, help me from this day forward to live a life after you. And to that, Lord, we love you and we thank you. Come on, just put your hands together for those who prayed for the first time, those who rededicated their life. Thank you, Jesus.